This video is supported by Brilliant. Hey hey, Marcus House with you here, and welcome to episode 300. Yes, we have been doing that this long. With the first orbital flight test of Starship rapidly approaching, SpaceX is making more progress than it may seem. But why did this happen? Yeah, that's interesting. Greg Scott is back up in the air again over the Cape site as well, so loads to dive into today. Falcon 9 roars into the sky with another batch of OneWeb satellites. Disaster for JAXA on the maiden flight of their new rocket. The International Space Station is preparing for a switch up. Relativity Space's Terran 1 was about to launch midweek, but an interesting scrub. What happened there? Yes, it has been a week of intrigue for sure, so let's jump into it. So, last week at Starbase, we left off with the huge progress on the orbital launch mount shielding. I'd say with the completion of it getting quite close now. In fact, it's probably a good time to explain how exactly I think SpaceX has designed it and what the future plans might be. At this point, I'm sure that you've seen all of the big panels by now, with some slight variations here and there, such as the panels with the doors, and there's also some variations built in to allow the shielding to go around the top of the stairway. Those with hawk like eyes, though, may have already spot this. There are still some quite big gaps between them. Now there is already a plan for those gaps because SpaceX is going to fully cover those up as well. On the top here, they've been hard at work installing plates to go on the outside. That does still leave the sides, which they are also covering up, but this time instead with plates going on the inside. If I had to guess why, I'd say that they have chosen to do this simply due to the fact that it's a lot easier to access from the inside compared to having to do it with the external lifts on the exterior. Now what about the future shielding? Speculative maybe, but just take a look at the metal framework installed here between one of the orbital launch mount legs and the mount itself. That too was recently installed, and I think that we're going to see this shielding further continue to eventually encompass all of the cryogenic lines. So in general, you might think that right now the activity has slowed. I think instead what we are seeing is the calm before the storm. Think of all the preparations that is needed to prepare to fly. Double and triple checking everything to ensure that the largest rocket ever created has the best chance of lifting off and finally becoming the largest ever human-made rocket to leave the ground. You can see here that they've already started painting the orbital launch mount again, giving it all a fresh coat after that 31 engine static fire weeks ago. We should see this paint covering all of the exposed metal surfaces, and that I'm sure is going to include all of those new shields once they have finished being welded. So it has been a little while since I've updated you on the suspected water deluge system. Right next to the orbital launch mount here, SpaceX has been hard at work. This week, multiple new pipes arrived, adding on to the collection of those already on site. SpaceX, I suspect, is now simply continuing as far along with this as they can before the actual flight, but none of it is actually required for the flight. By working on this now, it can be installed as quickly as possible once Booster 7 and Ship 24 together have made that groundbreaking orbital attempt. They have been steadily working on the deluge system here too. Just check this out, loads of parts are scattered around all over the place. A few of the critical things that caught my eye though are these parts here which have multiple rows of smaller outlets. These should spray water on top of the concrete to provide a healthy buffer. How all of this goes together is a bit of a puzzle, but if we take a look at how it looks over at Launch Complex 39A, we've got some good hints at what they are attempting. Over here, we can see that they've got a hexagonal shape laid around the six legs. However, over at Starbase, this is an issue because multiple legs have actually got propellant lines already running very close. This shot from RGV Aerial Photography from back in September 2021 shows that quite well. That, I think, also explains why they are making everything in a little bit more of a modular fashion here at the Sanchez site. They are going to need to thread between all of those pipelines. They can't just drop the entire structure over the top. Now, this was a surprising development. The booster transport stand, previously stored for months near the orbital tank farm, was moved toward the stacking point by the tower. Just yesterday, on Friday, the pad cleared and the arms made their way up the tower. In moments, they had closed in on Booster 7. Yes, once again, the booster was being lifted off the orbital launch mount. Something new to see here are these. SpaceX seems to be using these covers now that fully protect the nozzles of the engines, at least the outer Raptor boost engines. Protect 
connection here from the salty ocean air and a load of orbital launch mount work I suspect is the reason for that. The center engines do still seem to be exposed given that their engine numbers are visible, but yes, there we have it. Booster 7 is back on its transport stand. I didn't think that we would be seeing this again, so why is it back down? Speculation, but I suspect that SpaceX is simply needing better access to work on some of the internal hardware near the launch clamps while completing the installation of the shielding. The answer to where Booster 7 was heading to may already be clear. At the time of rendering this video, it was still at the tower, but perhaps it is just going to be placed on the booster holding pad right near the launch site. At the build site, Ship 26 once again made an appearance out of the high bay to be placed inside the middle of the ring yard, just like Ship 25 was recently. Now this is kind of curious because we haven't yet seen the telltale signs of the engines being installed just yet, something that in the past involved lifting the full ship up inside the high bay so that the engines could be installed. Sadly, those lifts need a lot of free space inside the high bay, something that is at a premium these days with the manufacturing speed going on. Well, take a look at this interesting new stand that has now popped up at the Rocket Garden. Its construction actually started a few weeks ago, but we wasn't really sure what it was for. This week, we saw SpaceX lifting what looks to be the top section of a ship transport stand. I'm wondering if they're going to start using this stand to install the engines and other necessary hardware onto the ships. After all, we've already seen that SpaceX is capable of installing both Raptor Vacuum and the normal gimbling sea level Raptors with what is lovingly referred to as the Raptor Van. This would free up the high bay for future ship stacking and allow other things such as finishing up the more intricate heat shield tiles. The question must be asked though, how is SpaceX going to lift the ship onto this new stand? Well, they've recently taken delivery of an LR1750 crane, which should be more than capable of lifting ships on top of that stand for the engine installation. It does all kind of look like a temporary solution, doesn't it? But perhaps there is a more permanent option coming. We've been trying to figure this out as it is speculative at this stage, but over here at what used to be the scrapyard, a drilling rig has been very hard at work installing a bunch of new pilings, pilings that look to be almost too big for any regular sized building. Perhaps instead this could be another mega bay sized building to further aid in manufacturing speed. The FAA environmental assessment after all did also mention that SpaceX was planning on building a payload processing building. Maybe they could then simply reassign the high bay for that purpose. That building does seem a little awkwardly sized with the current Starship production speed. Now while we are at the high bay, this week SpaceX lifted Ship 27 off the turntable and onto a ship stand ready to undergo further work. Ship 28's nose cone was soon rolled in, indicating again that after quite a lengthy delay, SpaceX is going to be stacking a new ship with heat shield tiles. That is a nice thing to see because although the vehicles without any tiles or other recovery hardware will serve purposes not totally clear, they do look really odd compared to the rest. A few hours later, the Ship 28 8 payload bay made an appearance as well, and just look at the Starlink Pez dispenser here. Included with that, all of the increased strength, just like the Ship 27 dispenser. In fact, later in the week, SpaceX attempted to do a double lift with the nose cone and the payload bay barrel. You can see here these chains hanging from the nose section. That's a great shot of it by Starship Gazer, and it's not the first time that SpaceX has done a double lift. However, it is the first attempt with a nose cone. After what seemed to be a little trouble, they ended ended up individually stacking them as usual, so they probably have to iron out a few issues. A quick mention of Booster 9 as well. This week at last we could see many Raptor engines making their way towards the Mega Bay. The first few here looked to be of the Raptor Boost variant, meaning that they do not have any gimbling capabilities on board. After a couple of those, they also moved some gimbling engines over as well. Just as a reminder, Booster 9 is going to be the first ever to use the new electric gimbling engines. Now you may remember this, the Structural Test Nose Cone. That has gotten its cap this week ahead of it being rolled out of the build site on these SPMTs. As seems to be quite typical these days, this too was moved during the night, joining the rest of the test tanks at the Massey site. It sure is busy over there. Next up will be to lift the nose cone testing rig over the nose cone to start the trial. 
Okay, so let's head all the way over to Florida. Our great friend Greg Scott took to the skies once again, and there's a nice bit of intel to check out here. These are the chopsticks as well as the carriage for the third Starship launch tower. They are still being assembled like they need all of this to be used right away. Just look at the difference since the last flight. SpaceX obviously seems quite certain that they can get the landing accuracy high enough for these vehicles. That is because these arms are the same length as those already installed on the Starship tower at 39A, and the those are shorter than the ones installed at Starbase Texas. Right next to that is the ship quick disconnect arm for that very same tower at 39A. That has still not been installed, and it surprised me for quite a while. What's more is that the huge tower stacking crane is in the process of being fully dismantled. That will be transported away from the pad, so with no way to lift the quick disconnect now, this arm will remain here for quite a while yet. Now, moving over to the tower sections for the third site, they haven't changed too much since the last flight. More components have gone in on this section, as that level needs a lot of control equipment, numerous valves to control the propellant lines, and also hydraulics to control the movement of everything on the ship quick disconnect arm. Finally, if we head over to the Star Factory, it looks to be near completion now, with only the tiniest bit of roofing still to go on the tallest section. Thankfully, for the comfort of the workers inside, the installation of those air conditioning units have now at least been partially completed. As always, such excellent perspectives that we get to check out here, and I think it's important to acknowledge the role that each and every one of you play in making this even possible. Your support of his content, whether it is through likes, shares, comments, or subscriptions, is what enables Greg to keep doing these flights. That is just phenomenal of you, and it helps him incredibly. No different to how your support of my channel here helps with us too. So we had another flawless Falcon 9 launch of the OneWeb 17 mission. Booster 1062 launched for its 13th time from Space Launch Complex 40 on Thursday this week. And you know, I just love these OneWeb launches because the boosters all return to the landing site. Exciting no matter what. Fairing deploy, and there are the 40 OneWeb satellites here loaded within. Collectively, all of those weigh in at about 6 metric tons or so. Unlike Starlink, these are quite a bit higher up. They're launched into this polar orbit, and after getting into position, they sit at around 1,200 kilometers in altitude. Comparatively, Starlink satellites are at an altitude of about half that. You've always got to love those daytime launches, and this afternoon view gave us these epic shots of the booster screaming down onto landing zone one. Beautiful every single time. Can you believe that this is already SpaceX's 16th launch this year? That's pretty impressive considering that we're only 10 weeks into the year. I think it's also worth mentioning as well that just over a week ago, OneWeb announced a partnership with Veyon Group, and that's pretty significant actually. The group's companies essentially serve around 510 million people across countries with an uneven population population distribution. Don't forget, those remote underserved areas are key to these new satellite networks. At this stage, OneWeb's constellation is a little over 80% complete, and they are still aiming for global coverage options this year once the remaining satellites are all in place. Similar to goals from Starlink, this partnership is going to help to increase emergency connectivity for disaster response. After all, Bayon Group has a core focus on 4G for all and humanitarian connectivity. I don't think anyone could really argue against the benefits of that. With this and Starlink, we are starting to see a global change to connectivity in pretty much any location. Yes, this may soon be a thing of the past. We have some unfortunate news from JAXA this week. The first test flight of their new H3 launch vehicle failed, and that caused the termination of the flight, destroying the entire launch vehicle and its satellite payload in the atmosphere. Don't forget, this was a long-awaited launch too. H3 was designed and developed by Japan's Aerospace Exploration Agency with Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, the successor to the H2A and H2B rocket variants. H3 has actually been under development for way longer than expected due to a constant stream of delays. The expectations were pretty high for this mission. Initially planned to launch a little over three weeks ago, H3 was ready to carry the Advanced Land Observing Satellite 3 to orbit. The launch was all set and good to go, the timer hit T-0, and confirmation of the main engine ignition. A few seconds later though, the rocket launched with all of the energy of a rubber chicken. Yeah, it didn't move an inch. Why though? Well, these two SRB-3 side boosters refused to ignite. The launch was obviously 
previously scrubbed, and then we were back early this week with Jax's second attempt. It was a smooth countdown, and this time a perfect liftoff as well. The rocket passed easily through the maximum aerodynamic pressure, where the forces on the rocket are the greatest a little over a minute in, and next up we had the jettison of the two solid rocket boosters. No problem there. However, five minutes into the launch, it was time for the first stage engines to cut off, stage separation, and ignition of the second stage. Ignition of the second stage. Yeah, that unfortunately we didn't get a confirmation of. Within moments, you could see a decrease instead of an increase in the velocity displayed on the live stream. Something was clearly wrong, and it was confirmed later by JAXA that the second stage had actually failed to ignite, and that they had followed up by sending a destruction command to the rocket. Later in the week, a preliminary meeting with experts explained that the issue is with the electric systems of the second stage engine. Now, it's obviously really sad to see these things happen, and to Tough luck there for JAXA. Remember though, it was their first attempt with this rocket, and it is quite common to find issues with the design of a maiden flight. Still, you never want to see it happen, and with numerous launches planned for the future, we're hoping that these skilled engineers at JAXA will be able to address that issue soon, before we get to witness the full capabilities of the H3. So obviously huge news covered in our last video was the arrival of Crew-6 at the International Space Station. That increased the total number of humans on board the ISS to a grand total of 11. Now that isn't the record number of people on board, but it is certainly very cramped right now. Ideally the station accommodates a crew of about 7 people, so 11 is well over that. Yeah, it must mean it's about time to fix that problem. NASA astronauts Nicole Mann and Josh Cassada, Koichi Wakata with JAXA, and Russian cosmonaut Anna Kikana will soon be home having been off-world for over 150 days on board the ISS, studying all sorts of things. Just one of those things was microgravity's effects on the cardiorespiratory system. That included modelling heart tissues in space and the 3D bioprinting of human tissues. Now they have of course been recently handing over all of their responsibilities to the station's newest crew members, and organising all of the cargo to bring back to Earth with Crew Dragon Endurance. With the station this week being so cramped, you do need a lot of supplies. Well, introducing something to look forward to next week, NASA and SpaceX's next resupply mission, CRS-27. Yes, Falcon 9 is once again going to launch the C-209 Cargo Dragon from Launch Complex 39A. As is now pretty routine, this Dragon is reused, with this being its third mission to the ISS, previously having completed the CRS-22 and CRS-24 missions. Given that SpaceX's current plan is to use their Cargo Dragon vehicles for five missions in total, this one in particular is most probably going to fly only two more missions after this one. So yes, keep an eye out for that launch, which should be happening midweek. Now, in last week's video, I was teasing the world's first 3D printed rocket launch. Seven years of hard work, design, engineering, building and testing, there it was, standing proud at Launch Complex 16 Cape Canaveral, getting ready for liftoff. Yes, they are beautiful shots of the first ever Terran 1 rocket ready to launch on Wednesday afternoon. Sadly, after all of that launch preparation, the attempt for the mission Good Luck Have Fun was scrubbed due to exceeding launch commit criteria limits for propellant thermal conditions on Stage 2. More on that in just a moment, but real quick, huge thanks to Brilliant Today for supporting this video. The absolute best way to learn math and computer science interactively. Whether you are a beginner or an advanced learner, Brilliant provides the tools and resources to help you dive deeper into math and science around many areas that I talk about in these very videos. With interactive courses and hands-on learning experiences, you'll be amazed at how quickly you'll master the skills that you need to take it to the next level. So why wait? There is always just so much to be excited about when playing with the interactive components here. Enhance those analytical abilities by challenging your mind with captivating conundrums and puzzles. There is also great programming material to get you more comfortable with the logic needed to step into more advanced topics. Artificial intelligence is becoming a much more crucial career path too. It is happening now, not just in the future, so to be part of the next tech revolution, get started here. These neural network exercises are just a tiny part of that journey. I just think that being able to see the effect of your actions visually like this is critical to understanding topics that can seem very daunting without them. In fact, you can try everything that Brilliant has to offer completely free for 30 full days. Just head to brilliant.org slash Marcus House or click the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Thank you, Brilliant. 
Okay, so why was the Terran 1 launch scrubbed? Essentially, they were not able to keep the propellant at the required temperature. One would think that they would have just been able to recycle and attempt again the next day, but interestingly, Relativity mentioned here that when using liquid natural gas, the methane needs to be the right concentration. Tim Ellis added to that, saying that the liquid natural gas needs to be conditioned. So, hey, we can be patient, can't we? Best of luck for the next attempt, which is hopefully coming within days. Now, if you cast your mind back to December, you'll remember that Falcon 9 launched a couple of spacecraft to the moon. The Hakuto RM1 lander built by iSpace and JAXA, also carrying the UAE's rover. iSpace on Twitter indicated just the other day that the vehicle is still healthy and should arrive at the moon in April. Really exciting to see that going well, but along with that mission, not so great news for NASA's Lunar Flashlight CubeSat, which hitched a ride on the same Falcon 9. This was equipped with new special equipment that would allow NASA to scan the Moon's south pole for water ice. The plan was to send this CubeSat to the Moon in the same near rectilinear halo orbit that the Lunar Gateway would be taking. As I talked about a month or so ago, unfortunately, shortly after launch, it was discovered that three of its four thrusters weren't working correctly. After attempts to fix that issue, right now, it is not quite possible for this spacecraft to get into its intended lunar orbit with such limited thrust. Instead, NASA is planning to attempt several lunar flybys in order to get the spacecraft into a high Earth orbit. That, if successful, should still allow the lunar flashlight to get close to the Moon once a month. So thank you to all of those incredible mission planning geniuses. And thank you for making it all the way through here, catching up on all the very best space news and updates of the week with me here. If you love what we do, loads of ways that you can help support. We've got merch like this on our store if you need some new gear. Checking that you are still subscribed helps too. YouTube for some reason likes to kick people off that list for some some strange reason. If you would like to chat with us directly and be more informed, you can join my incredible dedicated patrons and members here on the right. You all make this channel what it is, and I'm super grateful every single week that we get to do this. Given the news today on Relativity Space this week, in the tile in the bottom left, we have my interview with CEO Tim Ellis, if you haven't seen that one. On the right, some deeper dive videos that you may enjoy as well. Thank you everyone for watching all this way through, and I'll see you all in the next video.